everyone welcome back to our sessions this time we are back with something interesting and emerging of course you know it's it's uh, pretty easy to learn about when it comes to theoretical knowledge but when it comes to demonstration it actually makes you feel good when it comes to learning because ultimately demo helps you in learning everything in an easier way so we are back with an stunning session through the expert lenses of swantika gupta she is a tech lead in noldus inc so this time we will be learning very interesting which is uh http for us which is one of the emerging technologies even i'm very curious to know what actually it is the features the nature and what are the support cases in scala so i'm very curious and i hope everyone there is eager to learn about what is http for us and definitely as the name suggests hands on means we will be going through the demonstration as well so uh welcome swantika the stage is all yours thank you so much kuldeepak hello everyone first of all thank you for this uh, energetic welcome to the uh, welcome to deepak so um, good morning good afternoon everyone i am swantika gupta as kuldeepak already mentioned i have been with knowledge for about 3 years as a tech lead now so uh, in this knowledge session we will be walking uh, through http forest and it won't be just like like the title also explains it won't be just a theoretical session that we'll be going through hopefully by the end of the session you will be having a good idea Uh, about how you can just go ahead and start implementing what all dependencies you will be requiring what all uh, you know changes in the code structure probably changes in the build files everything that you'll be requiring in order to build your first own build with your own hand http forest application that is the main objective of this session uh, but before we get into that let's just start with the no knowledge etiquettes as you all very much know first important etiquette that we have for these sessions is the punctuality and i see that we all have joined on good time though but yeah uh, punctuality being the first etiquette let's we'll uh, you know we request everyone to join the session 5 minutes prior to the start time of the session the other one would be keeping the cell phones and your chats on a silent mode if it is something urgent which requires your attention please feel free to drop out of the call for a minute or two uh, you know get your work in order and then join back avoid any kind of disturbances or chit chat during the sessions but of, uh, of course the questions are always welcomed and the most important one the feedback please make sure to submit a constructive feedback so that it, it will be helpful for me and all of the presenters in the you know future sessions that we will be conducting now uh, since that is out of our uh, criteria let's just get get ahead with the session so uh, the agenda for today the http forest library that we will be looking into from a very wide lens from the top view we will be discussing about four different points four different sub topics that is first of all a very basic generic introduction to http forest and nonetheless that would be kind of a theoretical one itself we'll just look at to what http forest brings to the plate brings to the platform brings to the different you know projects and the structures that already have been developed then we'll dig a little deeper and we'll walk through the domain specific language of http forest how does it make creating the services creating the routes creating servers clients so easier as compared to all the other better probably or in some terms not might be that better alternates that we have for creating http services how http forest you know stands a little ahead uh, from them then something that i find http forest very useful with and very interesting and sometimes troublesome to work with is its streaming nature how http forest brings the body into a streaming nature how we work with that streaming nature of that data and finally <clears throat> one of the major things like as a developer we'll always have to work with the json support for all our requests and all our responses and what http forest provides as a you know module maybe a third party module for the uh route for the uh, uh interoperability communication between the servers and the clients so that is provided by the circ module for instance and we'll be looking into how we can use that for our benefit and uh, like i was mentioning these are these are just the top points that we will be covering and we'll dig in we'll dig into them one at a time looking at how we create endpoints probably how we create servers how we extract re requests how we send and receive json files so all those will be covered as part of the hands on with this session now before you know going on to the practical one let's start off with a very easy very you know easy to understandable theoretical part of http forest that is what is http forest and what makes it different from all the other alternates 
so uh, in very simple terms let me just start by saying that http 4s is scala's interface to http services right uh, even if we have not worked it, with it but we still know java servlets so it is just scala's answer to what servlets are to java right and it is a library so it's not a framework you know when you think about a framework you feel excited that you want to incorporate a framework it will give you opportunity to work with a lot of different operations that are available across the framework no jurisdiction but then uh, with frameworks come a lot of uh, things that you need to worry about for example let's say that the code needs to be written or the directory structure should be cre created in such or such fashion right that becomes a hindrance sometimes and due to this and due to that a lot of code needs to be revamped lot of code needs to be reshuffled so as to fit that directory structure which will also provide problems when we'll have to work with testing those particular structures that we have just created so using frameworks it becomes a little bit tedious though we will get a job done but that becomes a little tedious to handle on the other hand http 4s first of all is a lightweight lightweight library it is minimalistic in nature so no extra burden of uh, handling other stuff just working on creating your servers your clients your routes right creating definitions for your routes and it is quite lightweight no extra things to worry about right second of all it is cross platform in nature so when i say cross platform in nature it will work very fine with either of your back end services whether it be uh, scala.js whether it be native scala whether you are you are wanting to deploy your services on a browser or you are testing on your local with a jvm anything works fine with http4s these and uh, these were the things that are you know an introductory to the http4s now here comes the interesting part for http4s that http4s stands on among other things on two different legs one is supported by cats and cats effect and the other is supported by the fs2 library so the pure functional nature and the typeful nature of http4s comes from the data structures it shares with cats how it interacts with the external environment how it takes care of the side effects that is something that uh, this library incorporates from the cats effect and how it takes care of large amount of streaming data in its body without loading it into the memory or caching it or memorization uh, mem memorizing it or any of those three, uh, criteria that is taken by the streaming nature provided by the fs2 streams so it is it is very important to understand that http 4s basically relies on all both of these the good points of both of these libraries that is the cats cats effects and as well as the fs2 all of this, all of this together the lightweightness the cross platform feature typeful being typeful being functional in nature being streaming in nature is what makes http 4s very performant in the current amount of data in the current amount of projects in the current amount of applications that we work with so this is all in a very small uh, you know screen probably in a small number of words we can say about http 4s that it is minimalistic lightweight library not a framework and provide functional as well as streaming nature to our http services <clears throat> moving on uh, http 4s has its heart in a type that is called as http routes what http routes is how do we define it we'll look into it but before going there we want to understand a very basic thing that we are seeing from this particular line on the screen so what http routes is a type alias right it is a type alias for closely monad transformers and i'm not going to be very you know um, formal with you and say that kleski i know what kleski is and you know what the monad transformer does but even i went through it and i understood what it basically uh, wants us to uh, you know look into so first of all the first thing that we want to see is that any http server be it any application be it any library that we want to use any http server should handle your request with a response right so there is one to one mapping between the request and the response but then on second thought on second thoughts you might realize that not every request will have a response right for uh, let's say that we have entered a request which is not handled by our server in that case it wouldn't provide a response let's say our you know the just the uh, request that we are sending it is malformed in that case it won't send back a response so basically this mapping of a request to a response it transforms into from a request to an option of a response where a request might return me some value good enough and in other cases it might return me a none or a failure saying that this particular request or a parameter in that request cannot be handled by any response in my server 
So we have moved from request to response mapping to request to an option of response. That is the first step. Now, this response that we are generating, since it is not a test environment that we'll be working with, it might be a production environment, right? So all of res all, all of our responses, they won't be generated in an isolation. They will have to require a, you know interaction with the external world. And as external world, I mean the databases, probably, probably the file system, probably any other thing outside the current application that it is running on. So there are a lot of side effects which might be uh, you know required or which might be necessary. Uh, in creating that response. And using CATS effect, we know that these responses, they can be the side effects, they can be encapsulated in an effect, let's say an F here, right? So now from request to response, we have moved on to request to an effect of option of response. And the effect encapsulates all the side effects that will be required in order to generate this response. This complete statement of a request to an F to an option of response, is actually a rap, is actually called the Kalesli Monad Transformer. <clears throat> Sorry. So this Kalesli Monad Transformer, if you look at, look at the structure as well, it is quite similar to what we have in the third point here. So we have an option, we have an effect F, an input request, and then an output as a response. And this HTTP routes is just a al alias to this Kalesli. So basically, in very simple terms, HTTP routes is a series of statements which will like allow us to convert our request into responses, optional responses, with a side effect in attached to it. So these are what HTTP routes particularly stand for. In your code, uh, you will be looking, when you will work on it, you'll see that we'll have both closely as the type of an annotation of a particular variable that we have declared, as well as the HTTP routes. So basically, there are analogous in these terms. Now, uh, this was you know, a theoretical one to look at how, uh, you know, type uh, HTTP uh, routes look when they are, you know, digged into. But what actually HTTP routes are, they are a series of statements, which are case statements in nature. So basically, here you can see it is just a single case statement that we're looking into, but there can be a series of these case statements. And each case statement will have a method type what type of HTTP method are you handling, whether it's, it is a get method or it is a post, put, delete, whatever, right? An endpoint that uh, should be handled by this particular case statement and the behavior that when this particular endpoint is hit, what is the behavior that is expected when this particular endpoint would be hit, right? So this is just one statement, but we'll be having a series of such statements where each endpoint method type will be mapped to a behavior, an expected behavior, right? And since it is a case statement, right? It's a bunch of case statements. Any of the statement which, get, which gets matched first would be our final behavior. So we'll have to arrange those case statements in such a way that all of our default endpoints as well as our specific endpoints are handled in such a way that none of them produces a behavior which is not expected, right? So uh, for creating a simple endpoint, you require three steps, like uh, three important points, like I already mentioned, that would be the request type, get, post, put, anything, the complete endpoint, and the final behavior, right? The behavior in this case is we are calculating the length of a string. This string, str variable, it is, part, it is passed as part of the endpoint itself. So it is a path parameter, right? So we are picking it up from the path parameter, we are applying our function to it, and then returning it as a response to whatever client is calling the service or the server or this API, right? Now, while creating any uh, route, you have to take con consider that the first part will be the root, right? Bas basically, when we will compile this code, we'll be able to run this and everything, you will observe that root basically consumes the first slash here. So root gets displaced by the first slash here and our, eight, and our complete uh, end will start from slash length slash str whatever will pass here. An important point to notice here would be that this path parameter will always be by default will always be a string in nature. So whatever we pass in through our endpoint, it will be a string in nature. And if in the future, if in, in our requirement particularly, we want to work with let's say not string and we want to convert it into an integer or a long or a double value, in that case we'll have to take care of that thing in our uh, route itself. Right, but by default, everything that will be passed over the server from the client as a part of the endpoint will be a string. Okay, and for all of this to work fine, 
not on the application, but when you'll be testing it, you will be requiring a runtime as well. So here we are using the global runtime. Uh, in case you want to have a specific use case, we'll have to change that as well. <clears throat> so this is what a single endpoint would look like using the HTTP 4S DSL. Now, in order to test or to run this endpoint, right, we'll require a server. Now, HTTP 4S comes with a bunch of native supports for different servers. We have every uh, builders, uh, client builder, server builders. We have Blaze server builder. I have used Blaze server builder for my use case, even though it is deprecated for the one that I was using with. But still, it was good enough to you know test it out, test out the changes. Now, uh, the basic syntax of creating a server remains the same with any of the uh, you know uh, third party things that you want to use. You would be providing it with a uh, uh, with a Hosting, you will be providing it with a port. You will be providing, you know, an interference on to how long will the server be running. For example, in my case, I have used as a use forever. So that means it will keep on running until and unless I externally terminate the server. So that is one thing. And the final part is the HTTP app. The with HTTP app API, it will be requiring, for instance, in our case, we are passing it as a router. So this router basically defines all the different, oh, sorry, all the different routes that it can access. Some of the routes, they might start with just a leading uh, leading slash, by, while the other routes, probably not the one that I just showed you, but some other routes, they might be starting with slash API slash something else, right? So all of these can be combined together in this particular format in case you require a router. And there are other ways as well, we'll look into the code again. And this can be passed as a part of with HTTP app. So this is how we will create a server. Now, but the thing with, uh, for example, right now we're learning HTTP 4S. I am learning HTTP 4S, right? So every time I create a route, I'll create a server, I'll create a client, I'll test it out. It is very tedious, even for very small changes. For example, let's say that a very small change being that, uh, first of all, I was testing with passing the path parameter as a string. Now I want to test how I can make it a uh, int, probably. So all of these small changes would require me to stop my server and client, make the changes, restart my server, restart my client, test those changes. So instead of doing this, HTTP 4S has allowed us, the HTTP 4S model, particularly the routes model, has allowed us to test all of our server changes, all of these path changes at the runtime using just Scala Ripple. So no extra creating the, uh, the server no need to create a client, no need to hit those endpoints directly from the client. We can directly use them, do them using the Scala Ripple, right? And this is, this is what I have done in my uh, demos, small, small chunks of demos as well. Okay. <clears throat> uh, still now we have learned how to create a server. We know what are HTTP routes, how we can define an HTTP route. Probably uh, right now I can see that we have only seen how we can define a get route. But yeah, we'll use the same implementation for others as well. Now we look into what all other things the DSL provides for us to in order to you know match our uh, routes that we are creating in a more efficient way, probably extracting whatever parameters we want from those routes that we are just hitting. So with, there are different techniques to do those. First of all, let me just minimize the screen and we'll move to the demo part as well okay so these are the worksheets that i've created just for the demo part and herein i have not created any <clears throat> server not created any client it's just if you look at the first part itself i've created my route i've directly sent it a request and i've run it in my environment just to see what the result would look like right so this is all you need to test any of your changes on the fly on the run not creating any uh, servers or clients so the first thing that we will be looking into is this arrow operator, right? This arrow operator on the left side, I've already informed that on the left side, we'll specify the method type that we are working with. In our case, we are working with get method type. On the right side, we will, we will be specifying the complete API endpoint. And I've already told that this route, it will disappear in when the final call will be made. It will be dis uh, dissolved or it will consume the leading slash. And then any path parameter if you want. So let's look into this one. So this is the route that we have created in the same manner. First of all, certain imports will be required. The, uh, some of the ones are directly from the HTTP 4S. Some others, for example, I'm working with, let's say, IO, right? So in that case, I require the CATS effect. And runtime, if you are testing it on your REPL. If you're working with the complete application, this won't be required. But if you're working with the, uh, on your REPL, then this runtime will be implicitly required here. 
so this is the first route that i've created and as you can see the actual call would some look something like this so we'll the root it will get dissolved like we in, uh, just saw then the first segment of the uh, of the complete endpoint and then the second segment right and when this is run let me just run it again okay uh, if it is running fine let me for easy visibility let me comment out this part and let's let's run this part itself so right now what it is doing is that we are hitting this particular endpoint the hello slash name of the person endpoint and we're running it we are not we materializing it basically we're not doing anything else when you look at the result for the same you will see that we get a response body so it is not something like we were expecting hello and the name of the person no we have a response body right and in that response body we have the status code so it was able to find that particular endpoint and hence the status code comes back to 100 the version of http it used headers if any which can be you know added as well if required the character set of the data that you are seeing and the content length but not the actual body of the data right but if we want to have a look at the body what we will do is the same command that we ran earlier but finally, when we were able, when we were able to get the response, we have encoded that data that we got from the hit request as a string, right? Initially, it was not found anywhere. It was basically a stream, uh, stream, as of till now. But now we have encoded it into a string, and encoding to these primitive types, string, int, long, double, these are implicitly supported or provided by the uh, uh by our http forest so we don't have to take care of adding anything extra to the import statements and when we finally run this our output would be hello comma and the name of the person which was passed as the path parameter right let's go to the second one then let me comment this one out okay now let's look at the second code first let's see what it is doing okay before going into this this is something that i found uh, while you know testing some of the changes this particular slash that we see while creating our routes this is left associative in nature right so and each uh, slash after the initial slash it slash it represents a segment so uh, this is just one segment of the path parameter that i'll be passing but if I don't want to do that, if I want to pass something like this, where we I pass multiple segments, right? And uh, it could be more, right? So let's see that it keeps on increasing. And then to handle all of these scenarios, what you'll have to do is add different values here again and again, which is very time consuming and not required. It's tedious in nature. So why would I want to do that? So for these particular cases, we have something uh, of a little bit of different form of the separator right and which is right associative in nature okay just a, 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 some points to keep in mind while using this operator the right associative operator let's skip the root here we won't be requiring root and anything which comes after the first slash or the using this operator would be passed as a complete string okay uh, not string sorry it will be passed as a complete segment together okay and now what we're doing is so uh, anything which comes after hello that is this. this these are all passed together as a segment right these are abbreviated together in the rest field okay and then we on our behavior side we are taking each segment and combining them together as a string okay let's try this one out let me comment out the first one here so what is happening is that all of the command or all of the parameters that i've passed after each slash those are combined together to form a single string and together added. Right? There might be a scenario where you will be requiring this thing, or it might not be. But yeah, it's good to know about these small things that the HTTP forest provides us with. Then another simple use case is that you're creating a service which works with selecting a particular type of file, let's say. But on the file, you want to have a validation done, or you just want to work with JSON file, let's say, or CSV file, let's say. Right, so we the uh, HTTP forest routes model it also takes care of matching on the basis of extension that you're working with, right? So that, that uh, this is what I've done. This is my final out. Uh, this is the endpoint that I want to hit. It's a simple slash followed by the name of the file and the extension. 
and in my use case, I want to handle just the JSON uh, extensions, right? So in my use, in my best case scenario, I'll get the correct response that you're, you asked for whatever file name, right? But if I change it to CSV, and I do not have any support for CSV here, in that case, I'll get a not found exception, right? And uh, basically, this will be a 404 error saying that this particular route, it is not handled by the server. So this is, these are the very first few steps you can always try to get started with your uh, route development. Okay. <clears throat> these are all the things which I mentioned on the slide as well. Moving on. Now, uh, like I was mentioning, there comes a very, very typical use case that you will be familiar with. You'll have to work around with it. Is that I already mentioned that my path parameter by default is a string in nature. So if I look into it, this will be a string in nature. But I don't want to work with string. I want to work with, let's say, double or an int or a long, some kind of such variable. Then the HTTP forest library provides support for that as well. Right. So let me move to the second worksheet. Let's first go through the example on the first side. Now, in my first example, what I want to do is given a user ID, I want to return the name of the user. A very straightforward. I've not done any logic here. I've just returned static files, uh, static uh, integers or static strings here and there. So uh, the endpoint that I want to hit is slash users slash 45, right? And this user ID, it will be a string in nature uh, by default, <clears throat> right? Now I have these extractors in HTTP 4 as these are the default ones, the int var, for example, it, this is a default one. What it will do is it will convert the string into a variable and hence the complete output here will be an integer. And it, now if you look at the user ID, it will be an int in nature. And I can directly use it for whatever business logic I want to apply. For example, in my case, I'm working with get username, which expects an integer variable. And when it gets an integer variable, it converts it into a string or returns a required string. So when I run this first case, this is what happens, right? I'm getting my expected response. Now, let me try something. Let me convert this 45, which was supposed to be a string to 4.5, which is again a string. But now conversion of this 4.5 to an integer would be something which won't be possible, right? And when that happens, I'll get a not found error, right? This not found is something which is coming because I'm doing this string mapping. If I just skip it from here. I'll get a 404 status showing that the path does not exist for me. Right. Okay. <clears throat> but the issue, probably not an issue, but this is something which is very limited in nature that uh, I only have two or three extractors which are already pre bundled into my library the int var, int double, int log. These are the minimum ones that I have. But now I have a scenario where I want to increase this support. And this is that scenario. Here, I want to get a temperature of a particular year, average temperature of a particular year, let's see. And I'm passing the year in, in my uh, URI itself, right? Again, this is a string. But for my logic to work, it is supposed to be converted into an year variable. So for that to happen, let's look at the route. This is what the route looks like, right? Weather, temperature, and then the date, which is supposedly string, but I have a wrapper over it, the local date var. And this is not something that is provided directly from the HTTP 4S library. No, I've created it. So local date var, where I've applied an unapply, you know, uh, use the unapply method, which converts string if applicable or if possible to a local date. Okay. And then I can use it ahead. So this is what is happening here. When I pass this string, it gets converted into a local date. And if it is a valid local date, it will go ahead and apply this function and return a particular value. Again, when I run it, I should be able to see the correct value. That is 42.23. Again, if I change this, let's say, if I uh, somehow malformed my date, then automatically this parsing would give an issue and I will finally end up with a 404 error saying that this particular API or endpoint was not found. Okay, uh, let's move on quickly. Then. This is another part of it where we can pass any uh, you know multi-dimensional objects as part of the URI again. 
So in my case, for example, I'm passing a key value pair where, uh, you know, the first, the, uh, the left, the items on the left side of the equal to, those are the keys and the ones on the right side are the values, right? And I'm naming it as any variable, call it name. So while creating my extractor for this one, this will be a matrix variable extractor and I'll be passing all the same things, same names which were being used in the URI. So this should match with this. The first key should match with the uh, first element of the list. The second should match with the second element of the list and so on, right? And if you'll have a close look, what I've done is, uh, I have integrated the previous uh, extractor that we used, the int var here as well. So this is extractor inside our custom extractor. Right. So again, logically, John, Doe and 55, all those would be string. But this int variable, int var extractor would convert the string to an integer. We'll go ahead with whatever logic that we have given, whatever behavior we have, we have given. And finally, the output would be something as expected. That is the name of the user, first and last name, along with the user ID. OK, now uh, these were all something that you do for, you know, local testing. Good enough. But when you come into a code that you are going to deploy on production, probably a more sophisticated approach is required, right? And this is one of those more sophisticated approach. We have matchers and decoders available for some of the primitive types, for example, string, long and end, while for some other types, we can create a custom one as well. So this is an example which, encaps in, which encaptures both of them. <clears throat> so here, <clears throat> our API, our endpoint, uh, where we are passing a country name, which is a string, and an year, which right now is a string, but we want to convert it to something else, right? So again, on our side as well, or on the server side as well, we have created an extractor. If we look into it, this is the extractor that we have created, the matcher we have created. And in the parameter, that is the name parameter, we'll be passing the value same as being passed in the API. So country should match with the name here, and similarly for year as well. Since this is pure string implicit conversions extraction that is happening, no implicits are required. Uh, HTTP 4S will take care of it. But the other one, the air, is something which is not implicitly provided. So along with the matcher, we'll have to write a decoder as well, an implicit decoder, which will take care of converting that particular integer into a year format, right? So for, from an integer, we are converting a year. Okay, and all of these are passed in the uh, endpoint itself. <clears throat> And finally, using these values, we can calculate or we can have our uh, custom logic defined. Again, the result here is as expected, which matches our input. OK, now why I was calling this approach as a sophisticated approach was because this is we are not doing anything extra out of the ordinary here. This was also managed in the before the examples that we looked at earlier as well. Right. But then there comes this parameter which is an optional query param decoder matcher, which takes care of a parameter if it is optional in nature, right? So for example, in my case, air parameter that is being passed is optional in nature. So that means this particular endpoint should work as well as this endpoint should work fine, right? The behavior would be different according to our custom logic, but none of them should go give me a 404 error saying that this particular endpoint is not present there. So let's try it out with a simple, with a direct explanation first. So we are passing a variable, right? Looking at the route, you see that this particular complete type returns to option of year. So what is happening implicitly is that the string, it is getting converted into year using our decoder, implicit decoder, right? And it is optional in nature. So that's why you are seeing an option of year there, right? And then on a custom logic, if we want, we can you know match it against whether a none value or a sum value. And depending upon, we have separate logics. So uh, just for a second, I will run it on. So if we are passing a year, right, then logically we should call this method. So this will be returned 52.66, which is expected value, right? But if I remove this year parameter and just let it be like this, it should not return me a 202 error, a 404 error saying the you know API is not found. It should return me the default behavior. So in case the optional year is none, then it will provide me value for the current year, which is hard written to 41.65. <coughs> okay, moving swiftly forward. Like the optional uh, decoder or matcher, we have another one, which is the validating query param decoder matcher, right? So what it does is, <coughs> sorry, what it does is, it allows us to validate the param that we are passing, 
So in our scenario, we are passing here 2005, right? Then we are passing it to uh, this particular matcher and we have an implicit decoder with it. This implicit decoder, what it is trying to do is it is trying to parse that particular string or integer into an ear. And if it does not happen, it returns a parse error, right? And that is how it is. Uh, that is how a negative value is taken care of. So it is validating the params that we are passing by an implicit decoder that we have provided as a custom, right? And based on that, we are returning either a bad request <coughs> or a correct value. So for example, this is the result you get. Uh, is it not here? Yeah, so this is the result that you get. <coughs> Sorry for that. When everything works fine, and if I'm not able to decode it, then we are getting a custom message. Could not decode the JSON. <coughs> I'm sorry for this. <clears throat> Finally, uh, we have a combination of both of them, the optional as well as the validating query parameter, where we provide the parameter as an optional value, right? So either it can be missing, that it can be available or it might not be available. And then again, we are validating the result to see that if, uh, you know, if you want to do a custom validation on the value that we're getting, that is also taken care of this optional validating query param decoder matcher. <coughs> okay, so I've taken a lot of time on these basic DSL statements. Now, uh, let me move on to something interesting uh, per se so again jumping back to the theoretical nature of http 4 is in the very first session in the very first slide or you know probably the second slide i mentioned that one of the things which make http 4 s different from the other apis uh, from the other libraries or uh, uh, frameworks available is that <coughs> <coughs> sorry is that HTTP 4S is streaming in nature, right? So what HTTP 4S library provides us with is entity body, right? And this entity body, it is nothing but an alias to stream f of byte. So f is the effect here, and it is returning us a stream of bytes. <coughs> <coughs> now, um, OK, sorry for this <coughs> again. This stream of byte that we are returning, that means that the complete data from the response or the request, the actual body, it is not something which is visible to us directly, right? So if I take you back to the code on the very first statement, or probably uh, I have it somewhere as well. <coughs> Let me try doing this one. <coughs> Okay, so uh, in the final, in, when we run this particular um, command without decoding or encoding into any other format, right, we see that we are getting a response <clears throat> body where we have all the other things except the body, right? So what it means is that the body, even though if you look at it closely, the headers and everything, those are something that we can read, right? So basically, those are not, those are passed properly. And hence, they are not 100% streaming, right? But the body, it is not available to us. Until and unless we either have it run in a, a you know, in a, a controlled environment using unsafe run sync, or the other way, we also encode in, into a format that is human readable, right? So that is how we get the result. So in uh, simple terms, the body of our request as well as our response, that is streaming in nature. So like I mentioned earlier, there's no need for the complete body to be present in the memory or in the cache or anywhere unless and until required. So a large streams of uh, streams of body could be processed by my server without uh, on the you know constant time without worrying about storing all of those data before sending it forward. So this is how it works in a streaming fashion. <clears throat> so this entity body, like I was mentioning, is basically an alias for stream of f of byte. And this entity body founds, uh, makes the basis of my request as well as response structure. So the one that I was showing here, this is the response structure, right? And similarly, we have a request structure. So anything we pass as a part of the request or the response will be streaming in nature. We won't have to worry about 
uh, getting uh, we won't have to worry about the size of the data that we're trying to receive or send right but then again working with streaming we'll have to take care of the encoders and decoders that we will be using so uh, http forest does have a lot of options for some of the native types for example for string file and input stream it already has encoders and decoders required that is what we have been using like the as string thing right this is something that we have been using already then <clears throat> for json like we were mentioning we have the circ and json forest native and then we also have support for xml using other modules available <clears throat> now <clears throat> uh, what i'm thinking is since we are on little crunch on time let me show you the demo first we'll walk through the demo and the circ library it will be completely covered there as well Okay, so looking at the code structure, I have two modules. One is a client, one is a server. Since I was mentioning that this is all fine if you want to do testing on the fly, right? But once you create a module or creating a code, uh, production level code, probably having separate out uh, clients and servers would be something that is beneficial. <clears throat> okay, let's have uh, a very Swantika, so sorry to disturb you, please kindly wrap up early because it's yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, quickly going through the demo, <clears throat> we have uh, our two runners basically. One is the client runner and the other one would be our <clears throat> uh, server runner. In the server runner, the code is quite straightforward. We have an HTTP server ready, <clears throat> which is a Blaze server uh, like was already mentioned, along with my routes, right? My, my routes, I have provided two different uh, sets of routes. One is the health check API, which is basically to just to see whether my route is working fine or my server is up or not. And then my user, like my business logic specific APIs. For my case, I'm working with user services. So these are all the APIs that I'm exposing from my user, uh, for my user maintenance or repository, right? <clears throat> now, uh, HTTP routes is basically composable in nature. When I say composable in nature, it means that I could have defined these set of APIs in one module and another set of APIs in a separate module. And I could just combine them together to form a same uh complete api points that can be hit using this operator right so these allow me to combine two or more http routes and create a single http route or a closely like i was mentioning earlier <clears throat> okay now uh on this is the server uh, that looks like now we have separate requests for example i have a get request which basically uh, on the basis of a parameter being passed it gets all the users either in ascending or descending order order then we have another get request where i can pass the id of the user and i can fetch just one particular user a post request where i can pass the complete user information and and have it being added to my database probably uh, a put request where i'm just editing some of the points of an already existing user and then a delete user in in the scenario that i want to delete a particular user with a user id from my list of users that i'm maintaining right <clears throat> and as you'll again have a look, this sort query param matcher, it is an optional query parameter matcher. So that means if the value is provided good, if it's not provided, then also it will be taken care of. And how it is taken care of is my, in, in my uh, business logic, I'm matching my logic to whether uh, it is ascending or descending. And then on the basis of if it is being passed as none, then I'm taking care of it uh, in a separate way. <clears throat> Okay, so this is the logic uh, that is. Sorry, Swantika, I have to interrupt because you know time has already been passed and I need to you know start the another session. Uh, okay, sure, no problem. All right. Um. Okay. Thank you guys for your time. Uh, I'll be posting all of these on the Tech Hub. Uh, for whenever you require or need a you know reference to the GitHub, I'll be posting it in the Tech Hub and you can have a look at it from there. Thanks, Vantika. Thanks for this wonderful session. And I hope everyone has, you know, enjoyed this session, came to know about a number of things about XTTP 4S. But yes, if you do have any doubts, since we are getting out of time, you can reach out to us, reach out to us on Gchat as well. We will be happy to answer you. So thanks everyone for attending session. Keep learning. Have a great day. Bye.